So I'm going to start with uh, a question. Why haven't offline first apps taken off? The big problem with the web is that it does not work offline. And even if you are online, if you're on a slow internet connection, uh, your app feels terrible. That sucks. Take a step back. That seems like a really big limitation of writing apps. So uh, there's this idea where uh, you write apps that, are, that work offline by taking offline into consideration from the very beginning. And what that really leads to is basically just writing a full local app. So the, the, the entire app's code um, and, the entire, um, and all of your data is completely local. That's really what it leads to, because to work offline and to boot it up offline, you kind of just have to do that. So it's a complete re-architecture. And personally, I actually like the term local first apps better. So the main problem why I think they haven't taken off is because syncing is very, very hard. And if you are a full local app, you have to deal with syncing, where if you have these apps across devices, um, then you have to sync your data across the devices. And it turns out this is actually super, super hard. You cannot just queue up changes into an array when you are offline, and then when you come back on online, push them out to the server. That does not work. Um, so a lot of local apps, they say that they have offline support, but you always end up running into these situations. You're doing stuff offline, and then suddenly this big red scary box comes up and says, attempting to restore connection. Changes made now may not be saved. I mean, come on, why don't you just tell me they won't be saved? Uh, OK. Um, so t let's take a step back. Uh, the first thing we need to do is we have to admit that local apps, they are a distributed system. There's no way around that. We have, multiple, ver we have uh, multiple instances of your app on different devices, and they can go off and do their own thing, and then they need to come back and sync up. That is a distributed system, and distributed systems are very hard to get right. So I am James Long. I did, I did create Prettier. Um, a lot of other people helped push it to mainstream, so I, I'm very grateful for those who these people are. Uh, recently, I've been working on an app called Actual. It's a personal finance app. Uh, you can go to actualbudget.com if you want to check it out. This is a full local app, but it seamlessly syncs across devices. So when I started Actual, these were my requirements. These were the features that I wanted to really have. It had to be available offline, and it had to be fast. It turns out when all of your data is local and it's just there all the time, you just end up getting a super fast app without much work. Focus on privacy. I also wanted the ability to provide arbitrary queries. All of this le uh, led me to just build a local app that felt way better than building a normal web app. So here's an example of doing arbitrary queries. This feature is not actually released yet. Uh, but if you have a um, couple years or you know, just, just a little bit of your financial data, you can come in here and create a custom report. And it has like a MongoDB-ish style syntax that just compiles down to a SQLite query. I'm essentially exposing SQLite directly to you. You would never, ever do this if you were writing a cloud-based app. You would never imagine taking arbitrary code and executing, um, executing it on your server, right? There's a reason why you don't do that. There's a reason why GraphQL doesn't even have a simple aggregate function like sum. But because all your data is local, sure, you can SQLite inject yourself as much as you want, whatever. Uh, so I realized, though, shoot, I need a mobile app, because you really do need to have your transactions on the go. So I was like, crap, I need to figure out syncing. Uh, so this led me down a whole path. Um, of you know, building a sync engine, pretty much for better or for worse. I stopped building a product, and I built my own sync engine. Uh, but I did launch my product, so at least there's that. Um, so th here's an example. You can fill in some budget values on one client. Of course, it can sync between desktop apps, too. So the second one syncs, and it got those budget values. Uh, it adds another one. And then this one also deletes a category. And then when the other one syncs up, so you can merge categories and do all this complicated stuff. The other one syncs up, and it has exactly the same state. So he, these were my, uh, my use cases. I have some very simple data. We're talking about a 5 to 10 megabyte SQLite database. We're not building a backend database that has to deal with a terabyte of data. This is a whole different world. Also, I had to have syncing on top of SQLite. I was not willing to switch databases. So if you, have to, if you wanted to use um, a couple of the other solutions out there, they require you to just trust them to take your data. I did not want to give up SQLite. It gives me sub-millisecond sub um, read queries, uh, which is absolutely amazing. It's a whole reason why the app is fast. So I was not willing to give up SQLite. The syncing has to be a layer on top of it. Um, to this day, I still don't understand why everything is so bundled together. 
Okay, so why is syncing so hard? There are two main problems, unreliable ordering and conflicts. Whatever we do here, whatever we do to solve this, it has to work 100% of the time. This has to be seamless. There can no, be never no, no data lost or no state of the app that gets into a, um, a, a case where it doesn't work. Because remember, this is a local app. You can't just refresh the tab. I'm accepting the responsibility that this is going to work 100% of the time. So let's talk about unreliable ordering. Uh, so say you have two devices or two clients, and they do changes over time. Um, let's just say that they are uh, you know, making setting properties of an object. We want to think about this as if it's one timeline, right? That there's a sequential order of events. The problem is, though, that we are distributed. We have two apps that are doing different things at different times. And when they try to sync up, they are going to receive the changes at different times. So B does not get A's changes directly when they happen. It's not like quantum computing or something like that. And so as the changes are propagated, um, synced back and forth between the devices, it's going to get them in different order. And so we can't just naively mutate our data as we are seeing changes. Otherwise, the first, uh, the first client would, would uh, apply A, C, D, and B, if you can read that. And then the second client would apply B, A, D, and C. So obviously, we can't do out of order mutations because the resulting state is going to be different. Uh, so backend apps or backend databases, they, do, they have this thing called strong consistency, and this requires a lot of coordination, and it's actually really complex, and a lot of them actually don't actually get it right. Um, a recent trend is to do eventual consistency, and this is a technique where you embrace the fact that there are multiple timelines. You embrace the fact that you are a distributed system, you admit that, and then you find solutions that mesh well with that instead of trying to go against that. So the, the idea here is, is there a way to where um, even if we get the changes in, in different order, is there a way that we can still produce the, sta the same state on each device? So this is the problem. If we can solve this and we have eventual consistency, as long as every single client has, re has seen the changes, the same changes, even if, even if they're out of order, then they will have the same state. So that is our goal. That is what we want to achieve. So how do we solve unreliable ordering? We need to assign timestamps. This is the first thing that, that, we, that we need to do. To do this, we can go back to Einstein. Time is relative. Its only net worth depends on, upon what we do as it is passing. So we don't need a, like a date.now timestamp. Obviously, there's clocks are horrible, and we can't actually rely on date.now. What we want is just some order of events. So we just want some relative order where when a change happens here, what changes has that device already seen? That's what we really want. So you could think of, you know, if it's just a, like a sequence ID, one, two, three, four. But we obviously can't do this because this would rely on some sort of global sequence ID um, and requires strong consistency. And we, we just can't do that. We need a, we need a way to do this per, per device. So to do that, you need a clock. And you need a special kind of clock. So there's a couple different types of clocks, like a vector clock. Fortunately, I don't, uh, un, unfortunately, I don't have time to actually explain how these clocks work. Uh, but there's a vector clock. There's another kind of clock called a hybrid logical clock, which is HLC. Uh, this is the kind of clock that I use. It's a super interesting clock. And what these clocks do is they exist per device. This is not something that exists on some local or, or like on some centralized server that everybody tries to coordinate with. These are per device clocks. What they do is they generate timestamps that we can assign to each change. So for example, this is what HLCs look like. HLCs are super cool because they can be serialized to just a normal string. Um, again, this, the timestamp can be any value. The vector clock is actually like a vector of like multiple entries and stuff like that. All that we care about is when you assign, um, when you assign a timestamp to a change, the clock is smart enough to give us, us being the ephemeral, like whoever is trying to sync, some data so that we can compare changes and say, did this change when it happened on this machine? Did it come after all of these other things that the machine has already seen? Right? So it's just a relative ordering. So this is an example. There's two changes. Set x to 3 has a timestamp, set x to 5. Set x, set x to 3 has a later timestamp. So the HLC provided this timestamp for us. And so if we were doing like a last right wins, then setting x to 3 would win in this case if you were applying both of these changes. So don't, don't get chipped up by the fact that it looks like we're actually using like a real date, like you see a real date in here. Uh, hyperlogical clocks, there's a whole paper written about the algorithm. It's super interesting. 
Um, and I don't have time to fully explain it right now, but just trust that we have this string that we can say, is the string less than this other string? Then that's the timestamp It came before that string. And that's what HLC is, uh, enable you to do. Now, Dijkstra said, simplicity is a prerequisite for, for reliability. This is a complex problem. Dis distributed apps and distributed systems is a complex problem. And the way to have it uh, reliable is to have a simple solution. Complex problems do not necessarily beget complex solutions. We want this to be super reliable, 100% reliable. In the face of terrible networks, in the face of you putting your phone down for two weeks, picking it back up, and then it syncs to all these complicated changes, right? It has to work 100% of the time. For this to happen, we have to have the least amount of code possible. And that is what is so good about hybrid logical clocks. This is the entire implementation of hybrid logical clocks. Zero dependencies here. It's 256 lines of, lines, lines of JavaScript, right? How cool is that? I mean, it seems, it seems like you could sit down and learn that in like a weekend, right? I feel like that a lot of times, uh, as developers, we overcomplicate things. We try to take on too much of the problem. Uh, let's try to distill things down into a single problem and solve that in 256 lines of JavaScript with no dependencies, because dependencies suck. All right, so we've solved, see, we've solved, sort of solved the ordering problem. So what about conflicts? There's nothing around the fact that you, two devices can go offline, set the same piece of data, and then come back off, and then come back online. So we haven't magically solved that somehow. Well, what do existing solutions do? They say, well, you got to write manual conflict resolution code, right? And the only response to that, my opinion, is, you know, did you just tell me to go screw myself? I mean, I believe I did, Bob. Because really, manual conflict resolution does not work. It's basically just issuing one of the hardest parts of this whole thing onto you. And as a developer, you are not going to write correct manual conflict resolvers. I'm not going to. And I think I'm smart. Um, there's just too hard. There's way too many edge cases to resolve conflicts. And conflicts, um, dealing with conflicts is something you need to be thinking about while you are structuring and shaping your data. It's not a post-processing step. It's not a post step that after everything syncs up, and then you resolve the conflicts. So the question is, how do we resolve conflicts then? There is an answer to this. It's this magical thing called CRDTs. OK, OK, I know what you're thinking. We're not going to get into any math. We're not going to do any complex stuff. It's really not as hard as it seems. Um, all it is is a partially ordered monoid in the category of endofunctors. Oh, with at least with at least upper bound. So it's a semi lattice essentially. Um, no, but really seriously, CRDTs. I'm just going to pick out the important parts for you, the parts that you need to build production apps. It's actually only a little bit of all of that theory. So CRDT stands for conflict-free replicated data types. You may, if you're familiar with this world, you may have seen all of these terms. These are just uh, implementations of CRDTs. So CRDT is just more of a broad term. There's no canonical implementation of them. All that it is, you don't have to worry about these at all. All that they are are data structures that have certain properties, two properties to be exact. One is that they are commutative, which means the order doesn't matter in which you apply the changes. The second is that they're idempotent, which means it doesn't matter how many times you apply that change. Think about that for a second. If it doesn't matter what order you apply changes, and it doesn't matter how many times you apply the change, you can essentially just throw changes over the wall. And if the state is not what you think it should be, then you just throw some more changes. I mean, it's essentially a superpower, right? Super reliable in the face of a crappy network or a distributed system. So let's just go through and look at what it would be to implement a CRDT. Let's say that we have this set of changes, um, x X, uh, set x to 300, and so we fill out the. Pro so we're just going to fill out the, this this object with uh, with with values as we apply these messages or these changes. So set x to 300, set y to 73, set x to 8. But wait, setting x to 8 didn't do anything, and that's because the timestamp is older, right? So the timestamp the timestamp is a key part of this because that's what enables this commutative and idempotent properties of these production ready CRDTs. I mean, you could do CRDTs in all sorts of ways, but these are the ones that all you need to build production apps. And then we assign Z to 114. So this is the resulting state, X, Y, and Z with these numbers. We could do this in any order. So set X to 8, set Y to 73. So here, X does equal 8, but it's because it hasn't seen this other message yet. So set X to 300. That timestamp is later, and so now it actually does apply that message. 
Congratulations, you just implemented your first CRDT. This is a last right wins map. This is basically just a set of messages that when you apply them through and get this object out, uh, you, you have a last right wins map. This is now distributed. You could uh, sync these changes across devices. So you have a map, uh, which is a basic building block for building a, 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 an app, right? Let's just replace that map with an LWW map. The only other thing you really need is a set. So a map is just like an item, like a to-do item. And a set is a collection of items, right? So those are kind of the building blocks of real apps. For a set, we can replace it with what's called a grow-only set, a G set. So an example of that would be you have a bunch of messages. Uh, there are two duplicate IDs here. So adding the same ID to the same set doesn't do anything. And the result is this set. So no, it's a grow-only set. You can never remove something from a set. So when something is distributed, you can never safely remove anything, right? Because you might get changes that actually change that object. But if you've already actually removed it from your local data, uh, then that's a problem. So you just never remove it. OK. So this is a G set. OK, so how do I make basic relational data into CRDTs? We have everything that we need to solve this. So remember, I have this SQLite database that I want to turn, that I want to treat as CRDTs. How do I implement this? Well, the answer is I can treat a SQLite table as a G set of LWW maps. And so to implement this, I have just one new table in my SQLite database. It's called the messages CRDT table. And this basically just saves all of the messages that I have ever seen, whether I generated them myself or I got them from other devices. It has a timestamp. It has a data set, which is just the table that it applies to. It has a row, which is the item ID. It has a column, and then, then, um, and then the value. So as these messages are trickling in, it's just think of it as like s selecting a cell in the SQLite table and putting a value right there, if the timestamp is greater than whatever value was there before. That's it. That's all I do, and I've built my entire app on that. Note, it's, it's important to note that if the item does not exist yet, like if there's no row for that ID, it just creates it, and then it puts that one value in that field. So it just sort of trickles down, gradually expands, uh, and I've built my entire app on this. So how does this actually look like um, while programming? So I have a function. So um, I can do raw SQL queries to read my data, right? That's the important part. That's what I really wanted in the first place. I can have super fast read queries. But to change the data, it's a little different. I have a couple of functions, like update, which uh, just takes the table, the ID, and then some fields. And it just generates some messages to push through the system. So to change my local data, it's exactly the same way as syncing. When I get messages from other people, it syncs it through. It pushes it through the syncing layer. When I change stuff myself, I just call update, generate some messages, and it pushes it through the syncing layer. It's all the exact same thing. So how do you delete stuff? We'll have a delete function, which takes a table and an ID. And this generates uh, a, a message which changes the tombstone field. So if I can ever remove something from this set, everything just has a tombstone field. Um, and I just set that value to 1. And then I just ignore those whenever I'm reading from them. So other features which I don't have time, time to talk about, um, you can ensure consistency with a Merkle tree. Merkle tree is a tree of hashes that represents all of the timestamps that, time that have been applied. That gives us something to compare across clients. Um, you can do end-to-end -end encryption here. So I, really, like, I can host this like a, like a, like a syncing server. Um, so just a very short, quick demo. I built this demo app. Uh, you can see that I, I've, I'm offline. I've killed the server. I can add stuff. And I'm going to add an item with a different category. And then, and then I'm going to delete that category on the other client. So what's going to happen here? It's going to sync that, that category. Or it's going to sync that item with a different category. So what should that first client have? Well, I've mapped that category onto personal. So once I've synced a couple of times, it eventually catches up and everything maps to personal. So you, you, when you're structuring your data, I can't go into all of the techniques for doing this, but you think about conflicts so that you just bypass them altogether and that there doesn't exist a conflict. That I have a table that maps the, the, the categories automatically, and I shape my data so that con conflicts can't even ever occur. So that's sort of the additional layer. Again, super simple. This is the client side implementation of the entire syncing layer and all of the database. 250 lines of JavaScript. So for all of this, if you go to my sample Git, GitHub repo, you can see the entire implementation of all of this. 132 lines of JavaScript on the server. It just gets messages, sends them back. The client is 630 lines of JavaScript. This is pretty much all of the code that I use in actual to build the entire syncing layer. And I've had really no problems with it. It's 65 tweets. How long does it take you to tweet 65 times? 
probably in bed, tweet like 20 times, so it's like three nights. Uh, so the only dependencies that it has are UUID and murmur hash, right? You're, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not shoving garbage into the closet, and then it's actually you're pulling in like a 150 megabyte dependency like Chris Hyman said yesterday. Uh, this is the real code. OK, so local apps have a very, very superior user experience. And I really want to encourage people to look into this more. And anybody who's working on this, I really encourage you to look into CRDTs uh, and, and um, simple methods to implement clocks. We've got to start simplifying our solutions and not take on so much code, uh, which, com which com like makes things more complex. Thank you.